In a Tibetan monastery in southern India, Buddhists pay homage to the reincarnation of a senior Lama. They believe Ling Rinpoche, once senior tutor to the Dalai Lama, has been reborn and is blessing them and the gifts they bring. He's here in the form of a five-year-old boy. The ceremonies have lasted all day, and in mid-afternoon, this remarkable infant still behaves with the composure expected of a high lama. Those who queue for a blessing are from many parts of the world and many walks of life. They include Richard Gere, the Hollywood film star. For 30 years, scientists have investigated other children who appear to remember previous lives. Tibetan Buddhists say they have their own ancient methods to precisely identify a child like this, the reincarnation of an 81-year-old Lama who died on Christmas Day, 1984. Is there real evidence for reincarnation, a form of life after death? Tibetans believe senior lamas who choose to be reborn can be traced by an ancient formula. This includes looking for mystic signs in the flame of a butter lamp, consulting oracles and astrologers, and meditation. The Dalai Lama led the search for Ling Rinpoche. A year after Rinpoche's death, search parties went to various Tibetan settlements. They returned with long lists of possible candidates. And the concerned people, you see, gave me full, I'll say one, quite big batch of paper on the list of the name. Then, through my, my own investigation, mm, not there. <laughs> then I asked them, not here, even though, you see, more than, I think, oh, 500 or something. Mm. Then I, I told them, oh, it seems not here, <laughs> that they are disappointed. <laughs> but then somehow, they again, you see, start to fight. Then, Near Dhamsara, the place called Beer, one child somehow, you see, they uh, missed. The child was found in this orphanage at Dharamsala. His mother had died and his father was too poor to support him. The infant was 21 months old. The search party said he appeared to know them. One member was a servant to the dead senior tutor for almost 50 years. Chanda. ແລະກໍແມ່ຊັນດາຈິດແຈ່ທີ່ແມ່ແມ່ຊັນດາສົມແຈ່ທາຍຊິນໍາຈິດແທ້ອັນທີ່ທີ່ແມ່ຊັນ
and they live in a bungalow next to the Drepong Monastery. At the end of this day of ceremonies, the boy, now Ling Rinpoche, will become a monk. The Tibetans say they have several children like this, high lamas who've chosen to be reborn. The University of Virginia is the center of research into claims by children to remember former lives. Almost 3,000 cases have been investigated by Professor Ian Stevenson. One child in 500 might have such memories, according to a survey in northern India. But the memories begin to fade by about the age of six. There seem to be fewer cases in the West. We do hear quite often from the parents of Western children that uh, they wish they'd known about this research uh, when their little boy was three years old because he was saying, I used to be a pilot and uh, I was shot down and we told him to stop telling fibs and, and now he doesn't remember anything and we can't uh, uh, say much to you about the case. So some cases are definitely suppressed in the West, but they are much more readily found in uh, South Asia than they are in the uh, United States and Canada and Western Europe. In British Columbia, Canada, there are people for whom reincarnation is an ingrained tradition, the North American Indian. They appear to be Christian, but older beliefs are just below the surface. These beliefs may have come from Asia, because the tribes are descendants of hunters who crossed from Asia when the continents were joined in the Ice Age. In Canada, Dr. Antonia Mills continues Dr. Stevenson's researches. Some claims of reincarnation involve birthmarks, perhaps corresponding to some injury in a past life. These will be checked against medical records. Dr. Mills has studied cases in other parts of the world. She knows there are differences here. In most tribal groups, the previous personality, the person who is said to be coming back, is closely related to the, the subject, to the child. And in such cases, it's very difficult to be sure that statements that the child might make are not based on knowledge that the child could learn from its parents speaking about this person. So one has to use a lot of caution in analyzing these cases. Among the congregation at Maurice Town Church is 82-year-old Emma Michelle of the Wet'suwet'en tribe. Mrs. Michelle believes in reincarnation. In this family photograph, she is aged four. With her is her brother Jimmy, whose battered body was pulled from the Skeena River. His death remained a mystery until years later, when Emma's infant grandson, also called Jimmy, was playing on the floor. The bell in the nearby church began to toll. The boy asked his grandmother why the bell was ringing. Mrs. Michelle said it was because a neighbor was dead. The child asked, who? Donald Gray, I said. Why he dies? He hired somebody to kill me that time. That's why I'm dying. He hired three men to kill me. That's why I'm dying too. Now he die, he said, and he laugh about him. The family believe young Jimmy was the reincarnation of his great uncle. He described in detail how his great uncle was beaten up and thrown into the river in a dispute over fishing rights. Gaffing the salmon in the Maurice Town Canyon is as dangerous as it looks, but it's a source of status and wealth. A chief has rights here and others must move aside. Jimmy Senior's right to fish was challenged by Donald Gray. There was a bitter quarrel. Ironically, the reincarnated Jimmy also died in the Skeena River. He fell or was thrown from this cliff. But his death has not ended the cycle of rebirth. There's always a cycle that you can't stop. And this is where the reincarnation fits in.
Another of Emma's grandchildren, Nelson, is a pupil at this lecture on the cycles of life. Nelson is believed to be a reincarnation of both Jimmy's. His family say that as an infant, Nelson could remember their previous lives. He used to wish he'd been born a girl, so then there'd be less chance of ending up dead for a third time in the Skeena River. Today, Nelson's memories have faded, but he used to tell his family about his previous lives and the car he once owned. He used to run around the car and he used to tell my parents and he used to tell them that this was his car and all the wheels were flat and he used to kick them and say this was his car, who did that to it? And he was just two, two and a half. Really little. Very small. All the children in this game are said to be reincarnates, not simply because of what they remember. Some have birthmarks corresponding with marks on the dead person whose life they spoke about. Newborn babies are minutely examined for telltale signs. Hey. Hey. I interrupt your card game. I wanted to take a picture of your the bump on your head. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. Your mom said it was This okay. child is said to be the reincarnation of an aunt who suffered a head wound before she died. This combination of statements by the child birthmarks, characteristics, medical conditions that relate to a previous personality. These have to be examined very carefully and in a number of cases the evidence is very difficult to explain. For example, these cases where the children have pierced ear marks. This is not something that would be genetically transmitted. Birthmarks on the ears are similar to scars caused by earrings worn by chiefs. In some cases, a tribal elder has had an announcing dream, saying that a chief has been reborn. An examination of the baby has then revealed the matching earmarks. I have not been able to think of an explanation that accounts for the phenomena in these cases other than reincarnation. But what reincarnation is, what is being reincarnated, that's of course still a very large question that's not fully understood. <laughs> Professor Stevenson has studied hundreds of birthmarks and birth defects in children who claim previous lives. I'm particularly interested in a collection we have about 15 cases where there are two birthmarks corresponding to bullet wounds of entry and exit. And uh, forensic pathologists know that nearly always when you, if you shoot somebody, the bullet wound of entry is small and round and the bullet wound of exit is large and irregular in shape. And that's the way our birthmarks and about half of these cases, they correspond exactly that way. This boy was born without a right ear, but with memories of the life of a man who was shot in the head. He remembered uh, the previous life of a peasant farmer, this was in Turkey, who went to sleep at the end of the day in a pasture, and a neighbor came along hunting rabbits, and in the twilight mistook uh, this uh, sleeping peasant for a rabbit and shot him with a shotgun at point-blank range. We were able to go to the government hospital where the wounded man had been taken and uh, there we found a report showing that he died about 10 days later of uh, hemorrhage in the brain. And this boy had memories uh, of uh, this uh, man's life and his, and his death. The skull of a Turkish miller killed by a blow to the back of the head with a flour shovel. This picture is from the official post-mortem report. Later, a child claimed to remember the at the back of the head with a flower shovel. This picture is from the official post-mortem report. Later, a child claimed to remember the miller's life. The boy had a misshapen skull. Violent death occurs frequently in Stevenson's best cases. He speculates that the trauma of such a death may cause it to be remembered. This Burmese man 
recalled a previous life as a notorious bandit who was captured and executed for murder. The hanging was bungled, so that he had to be hanged twice. And um, the subject who had the memories of this brigand uh, was born with a almost absent lower jaw. His mandible was uh, exceedingly small and his mouth was very narrow and tight so that he really can only take liquid food and he can't open his mouth. But birth defects of the kinds that uh, we have in these cases uh, are uncommon and they're not the sort that you find in the textbooks of birth defects, the monographs, with rare exceptions. A few of them are, but most of them are not. In a village in northern India in the 1970s, a small boy lost the fingers of his right hand in a fodder chopping machine. Later the child died, but in a neighboring village, a boy was born who claimed memories of the dead child's life. There was other evidence too. Lek Pal's case was investigated by Dr. Stevenson and the Indian parapsychologist Dr. Satvant Pasricha. Being born with missing fingers is very rare and the corresponding feature in the previous personality adds to its importance. So the same fingers were chopped off. Also, uh, there was no family history of uh, missing fingers and uh, there was no such case in the whole of village. Dr. Pasricha says a weakness of the case is that the two villages are only five miles apart. Details of the dead child's accident could have been known in both places. Dr. Pasricha went with Lekpal to the house of the dead boy. Inside were the child's mother and older brother. The boy was recognized and accepted by both. Lekpal lives here for much of the year. So, you feel like your son is here? Yes, my son is here. Yes, my son is here. जब मैं वहाँ गया था पहली बार इनके यहाँ वहाँ एक शादी मैंने कराई थी तो वहाँ मैं पहली बार गया तो जब मेरे पास आया मैंने मैं तीन चार भाई है सभी जने बैठे थे वहाँ तो इसने वहाँ पहचान लिया बोला ये मेरा भाई है ये हमारे भाई है एक हमारी बहन थी हम करीब पचास आदमी घर में एक ही बहन है मेरे पास अच्छा तो ये हमारी माता जी भी है तो आपको लगता है कि आपका बेटा ही है the mother of the dead boy is certain Lekpal is her son and not simply because of the evidence of his damaged hand. In Bangalore, Dr. Pasricha is an associate clinical professor at one of India's largest mental hospitals. For 11 years, she studied evidence for reincarnation and investigated 350 cases. Some subjects have a phobia a fear that seems to come from some incident before they were born. Others have a great emotional attachment for their previous families. One of Dr. Pasricha's earliest cases was a girl aged two who remembered life as another little girl who drowned in a well. This was in a village in the same part of northern India. Today, in the Hindu holy city of Brindavan, Manju Sharma is a young married woman with two small daughters of her own. 
वहाँ पे पहले गाँव मारे में मतलब चौमा में ढाई साल की दस साल की कुआ में गिर के मर गई तो मैंने वहाँ पे दो साल में आप दस साल की थी हाँ हाँ जब कुआ में गिर के कुआ में गिर के मैं मर गई हाँ मैंने ढाई साल के मैं जन्म लिया वहाँ पे पास होली तो फिर वहाँ पे हमारे ताव जी है ना कपड़ा मतलब तगा तो करने जाते थे तो वो मैंने पहचान ली थी हमारे ताव जी हैं उसने कही कि नहीं जी पिछले जन्म हाँ उसने कही कि नहीं हमारी लड़की तो मर गई मैं नहीं मेरे ताव जी हैं तो उसने कहा कि हम तुम्हारे मैया आपको भेजेंगे तुम यहीं पर रहे तो उन्हें मैया को मेरे को पहले भेजा चौमा वाले को तो वो आए वहाँ पर तो उन्हें प्यार करा मतलब मिठाई विठाई लेके आए थे सब तो उन्हें गोदी गोदी में बैठा दी As a child, Manju's feelings were so strong, she insisted on living with the dead girl's family for 10 years. Critics say these children are from poor families trying to claim a relationship with a wealthier one. Manju is the opposite. She is a high caste Brahmin who chose to live with a poorer family from a lower caste. In class ridden India, this is an unlikely relationship. Manju has divided her life between these two families. Manju has outgrown her fear of wells, even of the place where she believes she once drowned. So I would consider this one of the strong cases. She started talking about her previous life when she was two and a half, and whatever she was describing, her emotions would change accordingly. Her facial expression would change, and nobody, I thought at that age, would have coached her to stage such a case. I don't think there is any apparent motive in this case to sort of cook up a case. and they were not gaining anything there were no obvious gains for the present family in fact they had to lose their child for 10 years not all dr pasrisha's cases were born with memories of another life in rural india she investigated a case of possession a dead person who appeared to survive by taking over the body of someone else in may 1985 in the remote village of sharifpura a young married woman sumitra had a seizure and seemed to die her father saw it happen khatam hui andaz doctor logon se lagaya acha koi aankh se nahi sharir nahi pani ho chuka tha acha aur taise hi andaz de aaye tum laga taise hi lagaye lo ja aur tak ke baad fir ye saansein phaasein ki wahi chali par che tab bhai jawab ki aisi baat aaj gayi bhi jo ki hum logon ko nahi kisi ko pehchana hai na तो चार दिन किसी को नहीं पहचाना तब हमने खुद बातचीत करी तो कुछ खड़ी बोली आई इनकी बोली में फर्क पड़ा तो इन्होंने कही हमारा तो नाम है नहीं कोई नहीं फिर का ससुराल मेरी दिव्या पर पियर मेरा टावा जो कभी बोल नहीं कही ससुराल पियर दे आए जब क्या बात है सुमित्रा इंसिस्टेड शी वाज दिस गर्ल शीवा a young housewife whose death was reported in some newspapers her body with head injuries was found beside a railway near her home but shiva had been murdered claims sumitra and her in-laws had tried to make it look like suicide there was some effort to bring the husband's family to trial for murder but there wasn't enough evidence to prove the charge shiva's father heard about the girl in the remote village who claimed to be his daughter and went to see her The girl recognized him immediately and spoke in detail of Shiva's life. She convinced him she was his daughter. तो फिर थोड़ा हमारे आंसू भी आ गए हमने कि जब इतना बतलाती फिर उसने बच्चों का नाम लिया सब पूरा अपना उसके बाद जो है इस तरह से सब फिर हमने उनसे कहा भी ठाकुर से रोके भी तो दूसरे दिन हम यहां लेकर के आए उसे जब यहां लेकर के आए तो मैंने वाइफ को जो था अलग बैठा लिया था इसी मकान में थे जब आप आए थे तो मैंने कहा जब उसने देखा तो उसे कोई यही नहीं दिखानी कि मम्मी कहाँ है तो उसने कहा यहाँ तो मम्मी है नहीं हमने की देखो इन्हीं में बैठी और लेडीज थी सब तो वह सब औरतें थी वहाँ बोली कि मम्मी तो यहाँ नहीं है फिर तो उसके बाद में पिताजी इनके बोले मम्मी को देखो कहाँ है तो इधर उधर देख के तो कमरा में पहुँची अंदर हम बैठे थे वहीं जाए मम्मी मम्मी कह के रोने लगी हमारे 
Dr. Pasricha checks Sumitra's statements against published accounts. The girl gave 16 facts about Shiva's life not mentioned in any press reports. Sumitra identified 22 relatives of the dead girl from photographs. Five years after Sumitra allegedly became possessed by Shiva, we called unannounced at the isolated village where Sumitra lives. Sumitra agreed to talk to us, but made it very clear she was as certain as ever about her inner identity. Dr. Pasricha also found evidence of changes in personality and behavior. Sumitra, the barefoot village girl who never went to school, has become more like Shiva, the educated daughter of a school teacher. After the changeover, she started wearing a sari in a different way, very dignified way, and also her chappas, sandals she'll put on, and she started addressing her husband also in a different way. Earlier she used to call him by his sister's name, so-and-so's brother. Then she started calling him in a very uh, sophisticated way. And also uh, she started writing. Before the changeover she could not do anything. Means she could barely read and write. But after the changeover she could write sentences and uh, she could speak also. I mean she could read uh, written Hindi. Dr. Pasrija and her colleagues recognize that where reincarnation is taken seriously, people often have a more tolerant view of unusual behavior. They have different ideas about the makeup of human personality. Are people something more than a combination of genes and the family environment? Just think of the way the average Western parent regards uh, his or her child. It's exactly the same as one regards an automobile that's come off a factory line. There was nothing before these bolts and bits and pieces of the car were assembled and painted. And that is the standard view that Western parents have of their children. They make the child. The attitude is quite different in countries where there's a belief in reincarnation. There, there is this third component of some existence before the conception of the current body as they would see the matter. So that the child bears some responsibility for what he does and says and how he, how he develops. The island of Sri Lanka in the Indian Ocean has provided some of the best cases for researchers. Buddhism is the main religion and reincarnation widely accepted. Investigators try to obtain untainted evidence. Their aim is to record a child's memories of another life before anyone knows the identity of the dead person the child is talking about. Several important Sri Lankan cases have been investigated by Professor Elenda Haraldson of the University of Iceland. He's with a Sri Lankan researcher, Godwin Samararatni. They've come for a further meeting with six-year-old Dilukshi. For the past three years, this little girl has been talking about a previous life as a small child in a district 70 miles away. A life that ended when she fell in a river and drowned. Lankan cases have been investigated by Professor Elenda Haraldson of the University of Iceland. He's with a Sri Lankan researcher, Godwin Samararatni. They've come for a further meeting with six-year-old Dilukshi. For the past three years, this little girl has been talking about a previous life as a small child in a district 70 miles away. A life that ended when she fell in a river and drowned. Dilukshi still remembers another set of parents and brothers and sisters. 
Colombo newspaper had published Deluxe's memories before any previous personality was discovered. The story was read by the father of a dead girl who said Deluxe's account of a drowning matched the life and death of his daughter, Shiromi. The reporter took Deluxe to the home of the drowned girl where she made several recognitions. We filmed another reunion between Dilukshi and the dead girl's parents. Before the newspaper brought them together, these families were quite unknown to each other. They lived in widely separated parts of the island and are still a little shy with each other. On a previous visit, Shiromi's father gave Dilukshi a silver whistle to match his own. The first time Dilukshi met Shiromi's mother, she said, Mother, I've come home at last. The reporter, Abby Parler, said Dilukshi had recognized some of the dead girl's toys and books. According to Professor Harrelson, this was useless as a scientific test. Shiromi's possessions should have been mixed up with objects that had not belonged to her. As it was, anything that Dilukshi pointed to could be taken as recognition of something belonging to Shiromi. Ten-year-old Shiromi had drowned in this river near her home a year before Dilukshi was born. Dilukshi led the way to the riverbank and showed where she remembered falling in and striking her head on a rock. It was the exact spot where Shiromi drowned in 1983. When Dilukshi visited here for the first time with the reporter Abby Pala, she identified the same place. Dilukshi had further stated that there had been a footbridge across the stream and, uh, and close to that footbridge was uh, her father's paddy fields. And when we think of uh, Shiromi, her father, Mr. Anatonga, he, had, he owns these uh, paddy fields, and there had in fact been a footbridge here over the stream. So uh, all these statements concerning the stream, they fit the life of Shiromi. Part of Dilukshi's story was verified during filming. She remembered a shop near Shiromi's home, run by a youth known as Thin Boy. The only likely shop had been closed for years. Why Professor Harrelson stopped to take pictures, but unexpectedly found himself being introduced to someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is the this is Thin Boy. Thin boy this yeah. is Himale. Yes, we used to have the shop here. A bonus for Professor Haroldson was that the Thin Boy remembered the drowned girl, Shiromi. She used to come into his shop. Harrelson regards this as a strong case. In a tropical downpour in Sri Lanka, a father escorts his daughters home from school. Ten-year-old Subashini has a fear of storms. During another downpour when she was three, the terrified child told her parents about a landslip on a mountainside during a thunderstorm. It was on a tea plantation where, she said, she had a different father and mother. Subashini no longer has these memories, only a fear of storms. Her mother remembers what she said. <laughs> Me 
मुकदमे इन्हें साध्य के नो आरा खांडवर तीनों दिके ला बालं दिके इधर बसे मैं ताताई मैं देना तो तो अच्छे का तरंगे लिए था वा लिए थे ने कोटो मापियों को में हीरो ना इधर बसे माँग को तो करे क्या लाभ हुआ इधर एक ना माँग इधर बसे दुआ गए ना तो अच्छे का तरंग कुलिया पीटा when Subashini was three, she demonstrated to her parents how tea was picked. She described the bushes in detail, although none grow where she lives. She said the tea pickers were Tamils, except for her own family, of Singhalese Buddhists. They lived in lines, which her middle-class parents didn't understand. But lines are the tea workers' name for their terrace shacks. They lived in Gampola, 60 miles away. Stevenson's researchers found there had indeed been a disaster on a tea plantation at Gampola two years before Subashini was born. There was lightning and thunder, and at about that 8 p.m., the rocks above this came down with mud and water, and it slipped down here, covering all these line rooms, half the line rooms, and it went down below about 200 to 250 yards below. I think about 28 people died on that, but unfortunately we were able to recover only about 13 bodies. Documents from the disaster inquiry confirm that the victims were Tamils, except for one family of Singhalese Buddhists. They had a seven-year-old daughter, Devi Malika, who seemed to match Subashini's statements. What happened to that family? There were five living at that time in that house, all were killed. These two who survived were outside on that special day. Devi Malika has a surviving brother and sister. Subashini's first visit here was abandoned when the child became hysterical with fear. Later, she met these two and they believe she is their sister reborn. Devi Malika's body was never recovered. Some of Subashini's details of life on this tea plantation were unverifiable. But the researchers say 25 of her 32 statements match the life of Devi Malika. Along with the other cases, is this story convincing evidence for reincarnation? I think where the evidence has led us is that whereas formerly a belief in reincarnation depended on uh, religious traditions, scriptures for certain countries, oral traditions for others. Now, at least, one can point to uh, evidence. And the evidence is not flawless. Uh, every case has some weakness or other. Uh, but there is an accumulation of quite strong evidence from, I would say, a hundred cases. Even for those hundred cases, there are alternative possibilities of interpretation, but reincarnation is, is certainly a, a plausible, I would say in some cases it's for me the most compelling interpretation, even though it's not the only one.